first, first of all, I want to say that I feel really privileged to be here and listen to so many uh, fantastic, enlightening pa papers. And thank you, Matt, for uh, introductory words and the uh, invitation to join the, the conference. And thank you, dear organizers, for such a fantastic hospitality. And when I received the invitation to speak about the notion of indigenous citizenship, I felt both excited. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I felt both excited and puzzled. As a historical anthropologist working with indigenous peoples, specifically Hnenets and Altaians, in the Russian Arctic and Siberia, and I anticipated challenges in addressing this topic. The context of citizenship or in Russian гражданство uh, debates in the Soviet Union differs significantly from discussions in other parts of the world for two major reasons. Firstly, the, the politics of positive discrimination led to the creation of national and at times even indigenous regions within the Soviet Union, accompanied by education in indigenous languages. At the very same time, some indigenous communities were recognized, while others remained invisible for metropolitan administrators. This was realized under socialism, with almost complete rejection of private property. And however, the Soviet state uh, also heavily oppressed ethnic minorities, including the forced uh, settlements of nomads and the relocation of entire nations to unfamiliar to them territories. These contradictions make the Soviet history of indigenous peoples in the north particularly difficult to analyze. My paper today is part of my second book project dedicated to the indigenous and environmental histories of Novaya Zemlya, an archipelago in the Russian Arctic, infamously known for the testing of over a hundred nuclear bombs during the Cold War. Novaya Zemlya is also notable for a certain freedom once enjoyed by its local com communities before the aggressive military colonization of the region in the 1950s. Recognizing that the history of even a relatively small place of land and a relatively small community can lead to a very long lecture, I am narrowing my talk down to the life history of Tiko Vilka, an indigenous Nenets herder, politician, amazing painter, an amazing author from Novaya Zemlya, who was the key figure in the history of the archipelago in the first half of the 20th century. A microhistorical pers perspective, as we have seen in the fantastic array of papers presented here, not only reveals the grassroots level of sovereignty, but also in a way bring us back to classic conceptualizations of sovereignty through the lens of one personality and their symbolic power. And in my paper, I will focus on the diaries, notes, and a short novel written by Tiko Vilka, the main protagonist of my study. With these preliminary notes, let me now turn to, to the story of Novaya Zemlya and Tikovilka. Over 60 years ago, the mushroom clouds of the Tsar Bomba, also commonly known as Kuskinamat, flushed over the Arctic archipelago of Novaya Zemlya, leaving an enduring impact on our planet. This image has become a symbol of the atomic age and the Cold War, representing the immense power wielded by humans and marking one of the possible beginnings of what scholars later would refer to as the Anthropocene era. This proposed epoch, which hasn't been officially approved by geologists, is characterized by significant human-induced dis dis disruptions to the environment. And this trend only intensified during the Cold War, characterized by techno-military aggression towards nature in general and indigenous lands in particular. Looking back, we often admit that the terrifying image has never faded away, and the lasting impact of those flashes continues to be invoked in discussions about not only the nuclear legacy, but also in the ongoing geopolitical tensions in the Arctic, especially in the context of nuclear fear reawoked by Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and the recent revocation of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty 
and reminders about possible nuclear weapons. Uh, test, testing that Kremlin and its pol political consultants sent to the world. Those even potential risks geographically bring us back to, to, to the territory of Novaya Zemlya, which remains the major military base of Russia, or Centralny Vayenny Polygon. Thus, the seemingly peripheral and sparsely inhabited or keep, uh, Archipelago continues to attract the attention of politicians and citizens of many countries, much like the images of melting Novaya Zemlya glaciers do in discussions about climate change. Despite this importance for indigenous po political and environmental history, the history of the archipelago is still narrated through the triumphalistic discovery and colonization story, where the narratives and stories of its inhabitants are quite often marginalized or even discarded from the metropolitan vision of the archipelago's uh, history, especially regarding its role in the geopolitical rivalry between two superpowers during the Cold War. And here, I come closer to the fascinating story of Tikavilka, an indigenous Nenets leader from Novaya Zemlya. His life history offers a unique lens through which we can explore the intricate dynamics of sovereignty in this remote, remote archipelago. Vilka's interactions with visiting travelers and scholars, late imperial and Soviet authorities, and eventually Soviet military personnel, along with his everyday engagement with the Novaya Zemlya environment, played a pivotal role in the region's history. Through these interactions, various conceptualizations of sovereignty over Novaya Zemlya were debated and Tested. And so sovereignty in this context is not just about administrative control of the te territory. It's about a deep entering connection to the land, as indicated in many papers presented during our conference. It becomes even more evident when it comes to the insular territories like Novaya Zemlya, which are often seen as self-contained miniature worlds or seedbeds of fertile imagination across various disciplines, such as biology, meteorology, anthropology, and economic th 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 theory, being exemplars of pristine nature. They have frequently been enmeshed in sovereignty claims and geopolitical relations, while also recognizing the insular pow powerlessness and political dependence of islands on the more technologically and intellectually advanced mainland. In other words, so 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 sovereignty is linked to the entering relationships between communities and the environment, as well as between com communities and the state. The social and cultural significance of Novaya Zemlya, therefore, becomes crucial. By examining Tiko, Tiko Vilka's life and the history of Novaya Zemlya, we can better understand the multifaceted and relational nature of sovereignty. Tiko Vilka was the son of an Enets hunter and expedition guide Hanets, or Konstantin Vilka. Due to seasonal food shortages on the mainland, specifically on the Yamal Peninsula, which is in the non northwest Siberia, his father, along with other Nenets families, s s settled in Novaya Zem Zemlya, which was an important resource for the Russian imperial economy during the 18th and 19th centuries, providing fur, blubber, and other products that allowed the Russian state to be integrated in the European market. However, the complex interplay of trade strategy, the subsistence economies of local and indigenous communities not only led to the colonization of the territory through Pamors and Khnenets, two major uh, ethnic groups uh, on their archipelago, as debtors of Russian mainland traders, but also transformed their position into Russian official settler colonizers on the far north frontier, despite their well-documented resistance to the state. This epistemic hegemony, along with the entangled social and economic relations between traders and locals, constituted the complexity of the early periods of colonization of the archipelago, where the notions of natives and s s settlers got blended, making them rather s survivors. And here I should note that the 
Pahmors, one of the communities on the uh, on the archipelago, are a, a community of Slavonic-speaking fishermen in the European part of Russia. Their language and culture significantly differed from those of other Russians, and their doc documented historical presence on the land is uh, um, as deep as uh, that of indigenous communities like Nenets. And consequently, Pahamors identified themselves as indigenous. However, Russian linguists and state-sponsored hist historians describe them as a group that best preserved ancient Russian culture and language elements. And therefore, metropolitan scholars and politicians often label Pahamors as the most Russian of Russians. The first known to us materialization of those sovereignty claims crosses that Pamor placed all over the north, including Novaya Zemlya, where they lived or regularly visited, and in wooden sacred idols on the islands and near seashores which the Hnenets placed. If for Pamors and Hnenets those objects made out of driftwood had agency to speak to other visitors as if saying that this land is part of the large network of their seasonal mobility and populated by their spirits, to Russian outsiders from the mainland, these narratives and material artifacts, on the contrary, reinforce the concept of the other and the well-studied uh, colonial stereotypes about mysterious inhabitants at the frozen age of the Ikuman. Let me now move to the overcast Arkhangelsk in November 2018. After spending several days studying archival documents from Novaya Zemlya, uh, dated to the 1930s in the local archive, I arranged a meeting at the Arkhangelsk Library to delve into a truly unique collection of documents left behind by Tiko Vilka. As I sat and, uh, in the quiet reading room of the library, I opened the first document, Tico's 1920s diary, and I was immediately captivated. Written in a cipher log given to him by one of the Norwegian or British sailors, the diary documented the everyday life of his hunters Artel. However, the writing was also to a large extent palimpsestos and heteroglossias, blending techniques for recording winds and weather from sailors and travelers with original drawings surrounded by concise notes depicting Hnenets and Pamor everyday practices. Moreover, Tika cut out uh, certain pieces of text and drawings, wrote over others, and frequently switched between different inks and pencils. The careful examination of this diary, along with another uh, preserved in the Arkhangelsk Museum, in the context of Tiko's activities, academic expeditions, relationships with artists and metropolitan politicians who nicknamed him the president of Novaya Zemlya, allows us to see how that not only influenced the shaping of his subjectivity, but also to a certain level of autonomy granted to the archipelago and the Tika Vilka. To provide a broader context, the early so Soviet redefinition of sovereignty was closely tied to the status of Arctic islands within the nascent so Soviet Union, which were designed a strategic borderland that territories facilitating Soviet control over the Arctic Sea route navigation. Novaya Zemlya, in this regard, played a pivotal role as a gateway between Europe and Asia, or Siberia. One can observe how Tiko Vilka adeptly navigated between indigenous concepts of sovereignty rooted in his deep connection with the lands, animals and birds, which ensured food security for himself and his community, and the dictates imposed from Moscow and Leningrad, where they officially declared aut autonomy of the archipelago was in reality quite limited. When the Soviet Union took full control over the archipelago and Tiko was elected as a chair of the Novozemelian Insular Council, his diary underwent a stylistic and I would say even an epistemic change. His everyday notes about hunting seals, arctic foxes, and polar bears were now accompanied by verbatim records of Soviet meetings or simple notes about past or upcoming political events. 
This diary was already written in a notebook from the Soviet Svetoch paper f f factory. And Tico turned his private diary into a tool for his political work, intertwined with the documentation of human environment relations on the archipelago, and most importantly, as a tool for documenting the Sovietization of the archipelago. It's not surprising to see that his 1930 diary opens with Tico Vilka's name frozen under the handwritten sequence of year numbers depicting the growth of his artel in the Belushya Guba settlement. An astute reader of early Soviet newspapers would likely recognize the similarity of this timeline to the official diagrams that depicted the industrial development of the Soviet country. These discursive changes evolved hand in hand with the gradual transformation of the archipelago into a resource laboratory for the Soviet economy. Within the initial appearance of Nazi submarines in the Barents Sea in the height of the Second World War, the Soviet military focused on safeguarding the northern territories, while reindeer orders from the mainland had already been militarized, the archipelago itself was converted into a military zone only in 1943. The new military center of Novaya Zemlya was established at Belushya Guba, or simply Belushka, where the Navy and Army sought the assistance of the Kvilka. The military documents accompanied the Red Star Medal he received in 1946 state. Having knowledge of, northern, of the northern terrain, Vilka IK crafted significant um, drawings of the Novaya Zemlya coastlines for geographical signs. Through these efforts, he aided the Navy in fortifying the northern communications of our motherland during the Great Patriotic War, which is the same as the Eastern Front uh, of the World War II. This document hi highlights two aspects of the transformations taking place on Novaya Zemlya in the 1940s. Firstly, it underscores the reliance of scholars and the military on indigenous knowledge. Local experts like Tiko Vilka often served as a source of stable knowledge. And secondly, it's worth noting that indigenous knowledge was exchanged for public recognition of Tikka's Vilka's uh, loyalty to, to the Soviet regime, uh, th uh, th theoretically guaranteeing a degree of autonomy for, for the community on Novaya Zemlya. He frequently featured on the front pages of Soviet newspapers and was portrayed as a hero in propaganda newsreels. During and especially after the conclusion of the war, the archipelago remains a focal point of military interest. The burgeoning atomic program in the Soviet Union necessitated fresh intellectual resources and suitable geographical locales for testing bombs. The increased potency of nuclear weapons outstripped the capabilities of the existing semi palatine test site located in the Kazakhstan steppe in Central Asia. Among various technological challenges, Soviet engineers required access to the uh, uh, yeah, required access to the ocean to test their inventions in water, a feature notably absent at the semi palatine state. Following the inaugural so, so Soviet nuclear bomb tests in 1949, military and engineers embarked on a quest for a new suitable location that met all their criteria. And you can read uh, those criteria on this slide. And Novaya Zemlya was chosen as the most suitable place for future nuclear bomb testing. And on July 31, 1944, the classified decision of the Council of Ministers of the USSR titled on the construction of Object 700. It's a new name for Novaya Zemlya in military documents, was signed by Prime Minister Georgi Malenkov. Consequently, a decision was made to relocate local families from Novaya Zemlya, first to the newly established Lagerne settlement on the archipelago, and only after several years, when testing was already underway, people were moved to the mainland and nearby islands, and also the city of Arkhangelsk.
It means that there had been reluctant eyewitnesses of the terrifying nuclear bomb testing for a few years. As Wilker witnessed the unfolding evolution, panic seized him. His despair mirrored a loss of the sensitive relations with the environment as well as his oratory and visual skills. His tears, as one of the Soviet officers described, were his only means of expressing the ontological conflict between his past and future ways of, live, uh, of, of, of life and the appropriation of the archipelago by those people, people and machines for whom these islands would become their home in his absence and that of his people. As I have highlighted throughout my paper, Tika Vilka transcended his identity as solely an indigenous individual. He also saw himself as a citizen of the state of the Soviet Union, recognizing the importance of his expertise to state expeditions, administrators and the military. This complexity elucidates the hybrid nature of sovereignty as applied to Novaya Zemlya as an insular territory by Moscow, and acknowledged by the local inhabitants, or other way around. Consequently, he endeavored to conceptualize the archipelago's transformation from a progressivist perspective, drawing upon narratives from Soviet newspapers, novels, radio broadcasts, and similar sources. I mean an untitled novella written by him in 1952, following the first military expeditions to the archipelago. Two years before the official appearance of the Object 700, again, that was the unofficial title of the Nova Yezimla in military documents, this novella was yet another surprise I stumbled upon during my archival trip to Arkhangelsk in 2018. Written as a techno-futuristic story, the text combines the reality of Tico's everyday notes with the potential transformation projects of Nova Yezimla into a zone with a warm climate promising successful plant agriculture. In the novella, he depicted his encounter with somebody named Fofanov, who came to Novaya Zemlya to replace him as its Soviet chair. During their conversation after a successful hunting trip, Tika Vilka shared with Fofanov his dreams about the future of the archipelago. Tiko, as a local dweller, drew Fofanov's attention to a small hill called Ostraya Sopka. They saw on the horizon that emitted some smoke. And Tiko explained to him that the warmth of the earth taken from this hill and from the hot subterranean worlds might provide the archipelago with the necessary amount of energy to turn it into a warm oasis. The story then transported the reader a hundred years into the future, where scholars from the Soviet Academy of Sciences engaged with Tico's archive and simply follow his ideas, ultimately discovering the miraculous significance of the hill. In the course of events depicted in the novella, new energy sources were discovered, and Novaya Zemlya became a prosperous oasis. Having settled in Arkhangelsk, he would allegedly portray Novozemelian landscapes, earing posthumous acclaim that reached far beyond the Soviet Union. Officially, his personal tragedy was eclipsed by the dominant narrative of his indigenous heritage and loyalty to the Soviets. He passed away in 1960 due to cancer, which was a major cause of death in the territories near Novoye Zemlya. Looking back, at the archive of Tiko Vilka, which forms the central narrative of my paper and uh, my upcoming book project, I perceive his diary and other writings as forward-looking text. Th through them, he beckoned his readers to contemplate the life history of Novaya Zemlya from a futuristic pers perspective, while remaining deeply rooted in the archipelago. Adopting a temporal perspective akin to that found in Soviet mass media alone with an indigenous situatedness allows us to reimagine our understanding of the history of nuclear bomb testing in the Arctic. The history of these bombs is not merely the result of military engineering and geopolitical rivalry between superpowers, but also the complexities of personal choices made by individuals like Tiko Vilka. 
I hope that by adopting a bottom-up approach to environmental disruptions, we may perceive the Anthropocene with a human face. Thank you.